Hi there. Uh, my name is Hassan Salam. I am a professor in obstetric and gynecology in Alexandria University in Egypt. And today I'm going to talk to you about the management of the infertile couple. In fact, uh, this is a series of talks, four of them. Uh, in the part one, we are going to talk about the, and uh, we're going to give an introduction and talk about the male factors in fertility. In the second part, I'm going to talk about the ovarian factor in fertility. In part three, uh, the cervical and tubal, uterine and peritoneal factors in fertility, and also of unexplained infertility. And finally, in part four, I'm going to talk about assisted reproduction technology. So let's start with the definition of infertility. What is the definition of infertility? Well, according to WHO, infertility is the failure to achieve a clinical pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. And here we have to differentiate between primary infertility, which means that the patient has never been pregnant before, and secondary infertility, where the patient has been pregnant before, even if this pregnancy ended in a miscarriage or even in ectopic pregnancy. And finally, of course, we have the voluntary infertility, where the patient does want to become pregnant really and is using a contraceptive. Uh, if we look at the cumulative pregnancy rate in cohabitating couples, we are going to see that uh, within one month, um, uh, people who are having unprotected intercourse, uh, 25 of them, 25 percent of them are going to become pregnant. Uh, within six months, 60 percent of them. Within 12 months, it will be 80 percent, and it's after 18 months that uh, the plateau will have to be will be reached at 90 percent. And uh, those who uh, do not become pregnant after 18 months will find it a bit difficult. To become pregnant afterwards. Therefore, the definition of infertility should really be uh, inability to uh, conceive after 18 months of unprotected intercourse. But uh, for the sake of uh, a general and generalicity, um, we are going to stick to the WHO uh, definition, which is one year. Uh, the prevalence of infertility, how common is it? Well, roughly, it's 10 percent. 10 percent of couples do not achieve a pregnancy. And if we want an exact, an exact figure, it's about 8.4, according to the study of Mosher and Platt, published in 1993. But of course, it differs. Are you talking about uh, young women aged for between 15 and 24, where the uh, prevalence of infertility would be about 4 percent? Or women between 25 and 34 years of age, where the infertility would be about 13 percent? Or women who are above 35, say between 35 and 44, where infertility will form about 30% of um, the cases. Now let's look at the prerequisites for a successful conception. Now on the left side we have of course male organs. The husband should be able to produce uh, sperm. The sperm are produced by the testis, as we all know. And uh, as we uh, we know, then uh, during ejaculation the the spermatozoa are ejaculated in a fluid which is produced by the prostate and seminal vesicle. On the right side, we see the female organs, the ovary which produces the oocytes, of course, which find their way to the fimbria of the fallopian tube where fertilization should happen, and then uh, the fertilized ovum will go th uh, to uh, the cavity of the uterus where implantation will happen and pregnancy will continue for. Um, uh, uh, 280 days really, uh, roughly nine months. Now these are the requirements. Uh, for a pregnancy to be achieved, we need that the husband uh, should have, or the male should have, uh, a normal semen analysis. We also need the woman to be ovulating uh, with an adequate luteinization. Uh, then uh, we need to have a normally functioning uh, cervix and healthy fallopian tubes. Uh, then we need to have a good uterine factor, meaning the uh, normal endometrium, where implantation is going to happen. And then also we need to have a normal peritoneal environment, which will not um, prevent the egg from being fertilized by the sperm. Uh, obviously, uh, the seventh requirement is to have proper uh, timing uh, of the sexual act. Sexual intercourse should happen at the right time. Now, these are the causes of infertility, according to the study uh, uh, by uh, Michael Hull, uh, published uh, a long time ago, 1983. But of course, the, uh, st uh, these figures still stand or are roughly uh, the same. For Michael Hull, he found uh, that out of his patients he studied, 
24% uh, had problems in the male, male factor infertility. 21% had ovulatory problems. 7% had a negative postcortical test, meaning that the cervical um, uh, factor was not um, functioning properly. 14% tumor problems. 6% endometriosis, which is uh, the peritoneal factor, as we mentioned before. And finally, uh, about 28% of the, the remaining patients, he could not find uh, a cause. Therefore, they were labeled as unexplained infertility. And um, let's uh, remember, uh, remind ourselves here by, about the uh, maximum fertile period, the best time for the woman to become pregnant. It is not the day of ovulation. In fact, the best time to become pregnant is just the day, one day before ovulation, as we can see from this study by Faust Italia, uh, published recently in 2019, but which is confirming uh, previous studies also. So, 40, the best day is really one day before ovulation, then two days before ovulation, then three days before ovulation, then the day of ovulation itself, then four days before ovulation, as we can see here. This was a study which was conducted on 225 uh, thousand women, uh, um, uh, thousand cycles from 98,000 women, as we can see here, using uh, one of these um, um, uh, devices which can tell the woman when she is going to ovulate. So let's start with the male factors in infertility. And now, this is the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. As, as you can see, the hypothalamus controls the pituitary and the pituitary in turn controls the testis. The hypothalamus produces the GnRH, the gonadotropin releasing hormones, uh, which stimulates the pituitary to secrete the FSH and the LH, the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. Uh, and uh, these uh, work on the testis, stimulate the testis to produce testosterone, as we can see on the right side, testosterone, which has a negative feedback mechanism on both the pituitary and the hypothalamus, something uh, similar to what happens in uh, the female. And here's the male reproductive system, as we can, uh, as we know all, the testis is uh, located outside the body because the best time to produce, the best temperature to produce the spermatozoa is probably in 29.3 degrees, it's not 37 degrees, this is why nature has given us the testis outside the human body. But then the spermatozoa will go into the epididymis and the vas deferens, which goes again inside the human body, where the temperature is 36, and then it could be joined by the seminal vesicle, and both uh, uh, pass through the prostate uh, to the uh, penile urethra. And during ejaculation, um, of course, the spermatozoa are produced by the testis, but the fluid itself, the seminal plasma, is produced by the seminal vesicle and the prostate. So what are the causes of infertility in the male? Well, the problem can be at the highest level, which is the hypothalamus pituitary lesion. For example, the Kalman syndrome or similar syndromes or having prolactinoma. It can be at the pituitary level, like uh, having a Klein-Felter syndrome, the Cartagen syndrome, testicular cryptokidism, undescended testis, or chitis, varicocele, immunological factors also. Uh, we can have an obstruction at the level of the vas, visual aplasia or an acquired obstruction due to an infection or uh, an operation which has gone wrongly or anything of the sort. Uh, number four are the accessory gland disorders like prostatitis or inflammation of the vesicles. And again, uh, we can have also coital defects like a man having hippotons or retrograde ejaculation. So if we look at the hypothalamic pituitary level, uh, a man can have a craniopharyngioma, which is going to destroy uh, the pituitary. Therefore, he is not going to produce the FSX and LH, which are needed to stimulate the testis to produce spermatozoa. Also, a prolactinoma is another tumor which can happen in the pituitary. Uh, um, prolactinoma is going, by sheer pressure, it's going to destroy part of the, of the pituitary, but it is also going to inhibit the production of FSH and LH. Uh, therefore, again, the, husband, the man will not be able to produce spermatozoa, or is going to affect his uh, uh, sperm uh, count um, to a different degree. Other causes of male infertility at the hypothalamus pituitary uh, level are the Kalman syndrome and the similar syndromes. 
and these syndromes are characterized by poor formation of GnRH and therefore uh, they, they affect uh, sperm uh, production. Uh, we know the Kalman syndrome it is associated with uh, anosmia, it's more common, but there are other similar syndromes like the Moby syndrome, the Lorenz Mombite syndrome, and other syndromes with similar effect. Kleinfelter syndrome is also uh, another uh, syndrome which is characterized by uh, uh, tri um, trisomy at the uh, uh, sex chromosomes. We have uh, two XXY, so the man has um, the phenotypical man has 47 chromosomes, as you can see here. He is phenotypically male, and some of these men have some areas of sperm production in their testes. It is characterized by being uh, tall, uh, they, is still, they are taller than average, they have reduced fair, uh, facial hair as you can see, reduced body hair, uh, some gynecomastia sometimes, osteoporosis, female fat distribution, and as I said, testicular atrophy, where sometimes we can see uh, islands of uh, spermatogenesis. This is why some of these patients can achieve pregnancy through ICSI, uh, using the testicular sperm. And this is uh, also uh, the normal sperm tail because some uh, syndromes are characterized by uh, um, formation of abnormal sperm. Now this is the, the, uh, the normal uh, tail of the sperm as you can see with nine uh, dynein arms and so on. But for example in a syndrome like the Kartashian syndrome as you can see on the right side uh, we have an abnormal distribution of the dynein arms. You have only eight uh, arms rather than uh, nine arms. Uh, cryptochitism or antisentic testis is another cause of male infertility as you can see here the testis can be arrested at different levels at the left you can see the testis uh, retained in the abdomen or having a partial descent or descended but not deep in the scrotum or interruption of the descent uh, beyond the internal inguinal uh, ring uh, varicocele is another cause of male infertility as you can see here uh, it can be seen on the surface of the scrotum, or, but it can also be only elucidated by uh, ultrasound uh, Doppler studies. Problems can also be present at the level of the vas deferens, for example, uh, um, congenital absence of uh, uh, the vas deferens, usually uh, both uh, vas deferentia are going to be um, congenitally absent uh, to affect um, um, sperm formation. If uh, one only is missing then sperm formation can still continue but on the right side also we have vasectomy some men can have vasectomy and then they would like to come back and have children then they will not be able to have children because they will have azoospermia they will not going to have sperm in their ejaculate retrograde ejaculation is also something that can happen due for example to diabetes or due to any uh, operation which is done at this level like for example prostatectomy or posha prostatectomy or sometimes uh, operations in the, the bladder where uh, the doctor uh, on the bladder uh, where the uh, urologist needs to do some form of dilatation of uh, at this level which is going to affect the nerve supply and therefore uh, during ejaculation the sperm will not proceed to the urethra but instead is going to be uh, retrogradely ejaculated into the bladder and then if the man goes to urinate after the sexual act we will find the sperms in his uh, urine okay so how do we evaluate the male factor now um, we really need to have a good history to ask about many questions in the, including endocrine diseases, infections, general genital operations, anything that has happened in the past which can affect um, the um, male uh, factor in infertility. Then we proceed to clinical examination, we do a general examination but also a local examination looking for example at things like cryptorchidism as just said or the testicular size or the varicocele as you can see on the right side here we have this uh, uh, gadget where we can judge according to it the size of uh, the testicle. Then we go for investigations. The most important investigation, of course, is the seminal fluid analysis. Uh, but sometimes, if we find that the seminal fluid analysis is not normal, we can go to specific tests to see exactly where is the problem. And sometimes we need to do the sperm function tests. 
So the first thing that the husband has to do is to do a semen analysis. But what are the reference values? As you can see, WHO has been changing the reference values every 10 years or so. And the most recent one was published in 2010, the so-called fifth edition. Now, according to this edition uh, by WHO, uh, the reference values for the volumes are uh, 1.5 uh, milliliters. So um, the husband, the volume of the sperm should be equal or more than 1.5 milliliters. The count should be more than 15, equal or more than 15 million per milliliter. The total count equal or more than 39 million uh, uh, spermatozoa. The motility uh, should be equal or more than 40 percent, of which progressive motility should be equal or more than 32 percent. Uh, the vitality, which means that the living sperms should be more or equal to 58%, and morphology or strict morphology should be equal or more than 4%, and then uh, the leukocytes should be uh, less than 1 million per milliliter. And here we have to remember some of these uh, uh, definitions or terms. Aspermia means no ejaculation. For example, if the person has... Um, retrograde ejaculation so he doesn't produce any fluid any ejaculate but azospermia means that there is an ejaculate which contains no sperm oligospermia few spermatozoa less than 15 million per milliliter athenospermia uh, weak or um, affect low motility uh, means less than 40 percent motility teratospermia uh, which is equal or more than four uh, percent of normal uh, abnormal uh, forms by strict morphology. Pyospermia, uh, more than 1 million leukocytes per milliliter, and necrospermia, meaning that there are no living sperms altogether. So when we look at the semen analysis of the male uh, partner, uh, we really should remember a few things. This is a study by uh, WHO um, doing a semen analysis for uh, one person uh, on a few occasions and actually every week uh, or, or after actually two times per week uh, over two years and as you can see here there are lots of variations the sperm count can go up to 180 and can go down to 3 million uh, sperms per milliliter therefore one has to remember this and the best thing really to do is to do two semen analysis uh, one or two weeks apart and then look at them if they are both uh, good so well and good if they are both bad we understand if one is high and one is low then we probably need to do a third uh, semen analysis uh, and another study here again uh, a sperm taken from the same donor uh, over four years and as you can see the same idea the sperm count goes up on the left side as you can see to 240 million uh, per milliliter and then can go down to 3 million per milliliter uh, as we said uh, before. How can we do the semen count? How, has, how is the semen count being done? It's done by uh, a cytometer, a cytometer which uh, counts the number of cells. Uh, the new power uh, cytometer which is used for uh, RBCs count can or for blood count in general can be used but there are now more specialized um, uh, sperm uh, counting chambers like the macular chamber where uh, the spermatozoa are counted. Uh, of course this can also be done by computerized means so we have different computer systems now capable of uh, counting the sperm. Uh, the sperm motility also um, should we should remember that the sperm motility um, uh, consists of three forms of motility. Progressive motility where the sperms move progressively um, uh, to the front or non-progressive motility which means that the sperms are a bit lazy in their movement or they move in the same place and the great sea is where the sperms do not move at all and this is uh, what uh, we have been seeing um, um, the WHO um, definition or the reference count is that we need to have at least 32 percent of the sperms with progressive uh, motility and the total motility at least 40 percent Sperm morphology also is another thing that uh, we should uh, be looking uh, at in our semen analysis. And as you can see, this is the sperm morphology. We have the head of the, of the sperm. We have the mid piece, which contains 
the mitochondria really which is the energy producing um, uh, um, items uh, in uh, the cells responsible for the movement of the tail then we have the tail and finally they have the end piece and uh, uh, we're not going to go into details but uh, these sperm morphology um, has in the past they have been uh, done in a very crude way but uh, um, the group of South Africa uh, led by uh, Professor Tinus Kruger have uh, taught us how to do uh, the sperm morphology in a strict manner and by doing this uh, we uh, they have discovered that um, the most of the men have abnormal sperms and if one has uh, four percent of normal forms or more uh, this should be counted as normal and when you look at this strict morphology what do we mean by this it means that we look at the head we see if there are any head defects at uh, the mid piece if there are any uh, abnormalities in the mid piece if uh, the sperm uh, does not have an acrosome or there are any tail defects and how is this being done it is being done by counting to, but lo by looking carefully at 200 spermatozoa, they are, the spermatozoa are stained by special stain and then uh, the person who is doing the analysis is going to look carefully at these numbers uh, of defects and tell us exactly what sort of defects we have. But as I said, we need at least 4% of the sperms to be uh, morphologically normal. Uh, another item to look at during our semen analysis is the agglutination and this agglutination can be head to head as you can see uh, on the left panel or tail to tail in the middle panel or even head to tail on the right panel and these uh, mean uh, the presence of agglutination means that there are either uh, antibodies, sperm antibodies or there is some sort of infection. So if the sperm analysis is good fine but if the sperm analysis shows us some abnormalities sometimes we need to look at some specific tests to see why the semen analysis is not good now this is of course what our colleague the andrologist done but for us we really need to know have some idea about what he does uh, he probably will ask for hormonal assays to see if there is a problem in the FSH and LH at the level and all the prolactin at the level of the pituitary or the, and also the testosterone if there is any problem uh, in the testis uh, itself. Vital staining is important to differentiate between spermatozoa who are not moving to see whether they are, they are living but not moving or if they are dead now, in the past this was not important but now this is important because if the sperm is not moving but it is living we can do uh, achieve pregnancy by ICSI intercellular blood sperm injection uh, hypoosmotic swelling test is again another test to differentiate between uh, immotile spermatozoa are they are they immotile because they are dead or are they immotile because uh, they are um, living but not moving. Uh, immunological tests also sometimes need to be done. Uh, semen culture and sensitivity to see if there is an infection. Uh, chemical constituents uh, like uh, zinc, citric acid, acid phosphate. This was done in the past to differentiate between uh, to see where the problem is. Is it at the level of the seminal vesicle or the uh, prostate or uh, uh, the testis itself? But uh, these tests are not being done frequently nowadays because uh, um, the novel methods of treatment specifically ICSI um, do not require us to do all this. Uh, testicular biopsy is sometimes being done and this can be done by an open method like this uh, to do a testis, a testicular uh, biopsy or uh, just by a needle biopsy and finally uh, we may need to do cytogenetic study to do the karyotype for example if we suspect a case of Kleinfelter syndrome. So these are the supra vital staining uh, of the sperm. Now uh, one of these uh, methods uses eucine nicrosine to differentiate between the cells which are dead uh, which will take the pink uh, color as you can see these are dead spermatozoa but the others the white ones which did not get the sperm they are living but they are not moving so we can use them uh, to do ICSI for example. A another test for the same purpose is the hypoosmotic swelling test. We put our immotile sperm in a hypoosmotic uh, solution so we find that the sperm 
either we'll move the tail uh, slightly or we'll start to be uh, to to, uh, to show some swelling uh, because of uh, the osmotic um, difference so as you can see we will then differentiate we will see that this sperm is uh, living but it is not moving therefore we can take it take it as it is like this and use it for uh, ICSI for example um, immunoassays test some people some men have uh, sperm antibodies in their own uh, seminal plasma now these antibodies will uh, stick the sperms together as we have shown before and uh, produce agglutination and this will prevent these sperms from um, fertilize the oocyte so if you want to know whether this man has uh, immune um, a problem we do the immunoassay test for example the immunobead tests now these beads are coated with some antibodies and therefore they are going to stick together as you can see here and the immune B test is going to be positive another test for the same purpose uses sensitized human RBCs instead of using the beads and then it will give us the same uh, idea they will stick together if we have antibody in cases of vasospermia we need to do a testicular biopsy uh, this is to differentiate between whether the test is, is pro functioning properly but there is an obstruction which we call obstructive vasospermia or whether there is no obstruction but the test is itself is not functioning properly so how do we do this we can do this by an open testicular biopsy we do a small incision uh, in the tunica albuginea and we remove a small piece of testicular tissue on which we do uh, the biopsy uh, alternatively we can use the needle biopsy uh, a white board needle uh, through which we can take a core biopsy uh, uh, with this needle so how do we interpret the testicular biopsy we either have normal histology which means that there is no there is only obstruction the test is functioning properly and there is uh, only obstruction therefore if we take uh, some spermatozoa from this test we will be able to achieve ICSI with a good uh, success rate alternatively we may have hypospermatogenesis which means that the function the test is not functioning at its best or spermatogenic arrest that the spermatogenesis is arrested at a certain stage for example it is at arrives until at the spermatid stage and then it stops uh, which means that we don't have spermiogenesis the final step which we need to give a edge for example or we have sertoli cells only which carries a bad prognosis because because we don't have spermatogonia and finally we may have tubular uh, fibrosis which means that this uh, testis has been destroyed before for example by mumps so all the previous tests really are descriptive tests and people have argued for many years that we need sperm function tests because the, the function of the sperm is to fertilize the egg so we need a test to fertilize the egg but as we know the fertilization process itself consists of many steps the first step is the acrosome reaction to, uh, for, to for the sperm to release the uh, acrosine and hyaluronidase form its acrosome the second thing is to fuse with the zona the third thing is to penetrate the oolema the oocyte itself the fourth thing is to fuse with the dna so people have come up with different function tests which we are going to describe uh, now the acrosome reaction test now we know that the head of the sperm contains a sac called the acrosome which contains the enzyme acrosine and hyaluronidase and when the sperm meets the egg it will start to release the uh, acrosine and um, the hyaluronidase the so-called the acrosome reaction now we can test whether the sperm has a good acrosome or not by staining it uh, using the white field microscopy or using fluorescent labels for which we need a micro, uh, fluorescent microscope or we can do this by flow cytometry uh, but what is more important is to stimulate the acrosome reaction itself by adding uh, calcium iron 4 a23187 or sometimes progesterone or other material to induce this uh, acrosome reaction and when you do this we can uh, look by uh, fluorescent microscopy as you can see and count the number of reacted uh, um, uh, 
the spermatozoa as we, as we can see. And we need, need an acrosome reaction of more than a score of more than 20% uh, percent, uh, for the man to be declared fertile. Uh, the second test is the hemizona binding test, which tests the capacity of the sperm to bind to the zona pellucida. And for this, we require, we need uh, oocytes. But where do we obtain these oocytes? Usually, they are obtained from an IVF program where the uh, extra oocytes have not been used or have been uh, used but did not fertilize. So, uh, uh, the sperm, the test, as you can see, the zona is divided into two. This is why it's called the hemizona assay. Uh, on one uh, half, uh, the spermatozoa of uh, the person is questioned or added, and the other half, a control uh, sperm is used, a control from a fertile uh, person. As, as you can see, uh, if um, the control is positive, then we have uh, binding. Um, if the control should be positive, of course, to so the test is, is is working. But on the other side, we will see whether our sperm has um, uh, bound to the zona or not. It's half of the zona or not. Uh, the third test is the hamster penetration test, which tests the ability of the spermatozoa to penetrate the actual uh, oocyte, the membrane of the oocyte, the oolemma. And for this, we need uh, or sites from which the zone has been removed, so it's called the zona free, and we use hamster uh, eggs for this. This test was introduced by Professor Yuzu uh, Yanagimashi from uh, the Kapiorani Medical Center in uh, Honolulu in Hawaii, but uh, the test has not really proven the test of time, because sometimes uh, the sperm may not be able to penetrate the hamster test, but when we do uh, the actual IVF for, for with with his wife, we can find that the sperm can penetrate the uh, oocyte of the wife. Therefore, the test has been uh, gone into disrepute. It's not uh, really uh, considered of value anymore. Uh, the other step, of course, is for the uh, DNA of the spermatozoa to um, react with the DNA of the oocyte and produce fertilization. Now, this is where the DNA fragmentation tests come into play. Now, this is, these are tests to check whether the DNA of the sperm are robust enough or uh, do they fragment uh, under the uh, first uh, test of stress. Uh, and if uh, the, our spermatozoa are not robust enough, we will find that they will fragment, producing either single-stranded DNA breaks, SSDB, as you can see on the left panel uh, below, or double-stranded DNA, as you can see in the middle, or basic deletion or modification of the sperm genes, as of A binding to T and uh, C uh, uh, binding to G, they may, may do uh, um, uh, deletions or modification, and or we can have intra or interstrand uh, cross-linking. And why does this happen? Now, during the um, process of maturation of the sperm, the final stage of maturation, which is called spermiogenesis. Now, the histoprotamines replace the histones. The histones are not as compact as proteins. So histones are replaced by proteins. The histones on the left side, as you can see, are, are, are replaced by proteins on the right side uh, through transition proteins P1 and P2. Uh, but to cut a long story short, the, 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 uh, the DNA uh, becomes more robust to allow it to go through the difficult process of uh, fertilizing the oocyte. And for this, we have different tests. There are many tests, but the most commonly used tests are either the sperm chromatin structural assay, the SCSA test, the tunnel test, which is an acronym for terminal deoxynucleotidyl uh, transferase uh, DUTP make labeling, or the sperm chromatin dispersion test, the SCD, or the HALO test, and finally the COMET test. Some of them are very uh, accurate but very expensive like the tunnel test, for example, and some of them are more practical, like the HALO test, which is commonly used. And uh, in this test, if um, our sperm is uh, good enough, we will find a HALO, uh, as you can see here. But if uh, we have uh, DNA fragmentation, we will find that there is no HALO forming, as you can see in this fragmented uh, sperm in 
the lower panel or the, even the degraded one on the left side, low left side, the halo test. And finally, we have the reactive oxygen species tests. Now, like the pH, uh, the metabolism in the body produces uh, reactive oxygen species. But the body contains uh, systems, antioxidants, which are going to take care of these ROS and produce this equilibrium so we don't have too many uh, oxygen species. Because if we have too many oxygen species, as we can see on the right side, this becomes pathological and we can call this condition oxidative stress. And why is oxidative stress bad? Because some oxidative stress is needed, some reactive oxygen species, I should say, are needed. But if there are too many, or that the antioxidant capacity is not enough to uh, take care of them, then we will have the oxidative stress. So this slide is borrowed from uh, Cleveland Clinic, Professor uh, Garwal. And as you can see um, in the top uh, panel, uh, some reactive oxygen species are needed. They are needed for capacitation, for acrosome reaction, for hyperactivation of the spermatozoa, and for spermocyte binding. But if our reactive oxygen species are too many, or uh, they are not being taken care of by the antioxidant systems, then we will have oxidative stress in the lower, lower panel. As you can see, we will have pathological roles rather than physiological roles. And these uh, uh, two um, excessive reactive oxygen species are going to affect the cell membrane, producing what we call lipid peroxidations, because the cell wall, as we remember, the cell membrane uh, is formed of phospholipids, then we will have lipid peroxidation. Uh, it can also produce DNA damage, leading to positive DNA fragmentation tests, or it can produce even apoptosis and cell death. And all this will lead to male infertility, as you can see in the lower panel. Now, where do these excessive reaction oxygen species come from? They can come from endogenous sources, as we can see on the left, or from exogenous sources, as you can see on the right. Ex endogenous uh, uh, sources include the presence of a varicocele, infection in the form of leukocytes, or the presence of immature spermatozoa. All these produce uh, too many reactive oxygen species. And on the right side, we see the exogenous sources, for example, smoking, uh, alcohol, toxins, and different forms of radiation, which in themselves can produce reactive oxygen species, leading to oxidative stress. Now, how to test for oxidative stress? There are many uh, methods. Most of them are complicated. They're not really uh, practical in the clinical uh, laboratory. But recently, a new system, a simple system, has been introduced by I2 Bioscience, the Myoxys system. And in this system, as you can see, on the right side, we have the reader, and on the left side, we have the <coughs> sensor. And you put the sensor in the reader, and then you put uh, 200 microliters of the sperm, and within two minutes, you will have your reading. And this is, of course, important if we are going to give the, uh, per, the, the patient antioxidants, because if you give too many oxid antioxidants, we may run into, um, instead, instead of having oxidative stress, we will have reductive stress, which is equally uh, pathological. Now, we come now to the management of male infertility. So, okay, we have a person who has done a semen analysis, and the semen analysis was not uh, good, so we did our um, other tests to see where the problem is, and then we will start treating our patient. We have medical treatment, we have surgical treatment, and we have, of course, the assisted reproduction. So, what are the medical treatments available for male uh, infertility? Now, there are non-specific measures, of course, to lead a healthy lifestyle, to stop smoking, etc. Uh, in technology treatment, we can use antiestrogens uh, to stimulate FSH and LH, and LH formation. If we are talking about oligospermia, we can uh, use uh, human menopausal neurotropins or uh, FSH really to do the same idea. If we have a high prolactin, we will use uh, bromocryptin. And uh, sometimes we need to use androgens or anti-androgens, and sometimes uh, in the past GnRH was actually used, but it needs a pump, and the pump will produce a pulse, a pulse every 90 minutes. It's not very practical because the pulse is go uh, the, uh, 
the tubing sometimes uh, are blocked and they have been uh, used but they're not really very uh, popular uh, antioxidants of course if we have oxidative stress or we think that we have oxidative stress but as i said it's important to monitor oxidative stress in order not to give too much uh, antioxidants which will run us into reductive stress um, antibiotics if we have an infection uh, we do a culture and sensitivity and we see what antibiotic is to be used uh, to use it if we have immunological uh, infertility we may need to use steroids usually steroids are used between day 14 and 28 of the cycle of the female consort because they take about 14 days to uh, function and therefore the doctor will ask about the, 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 the cycle of the woman in uh, before giving these steroids to the man and finally the treatment of erectile dysfunction Sometimes the problem is only that the husband has impotence, for example. So in this case, we will treat the cause, if it is a psychological cause, or is it really a physical cause? Is it diabetes? Is it uh, any other cause? And finally, uh, of course, with this, we have sildenafil and the different other variants of uh, these uh, modes of treatment. Uh, we have, of course, the antioxidant, as I said. Uh, of these, we have vitamin E, vitamin C, magnesium, zinc, n cysteine, uh, folic acid, carnitines, uh, selenium, DHEA, and the coenzyme Q10. And some preparations on the market contain uh, more than one of these antioxidants, which are given to the husband. As I said, we need to monitor uh, the treatment with um, the measurement of uh, oxidative stress in the semen. The second line of treatment is the surgical treatment. Now, this is of value uh, in some uh, cases like varicocelectomy, vasovasostomy, epididymosostomy, or kidovasostomy even. Varicocelia. Now, Dupin and Amelar uh, produced a study um, in the uh, late 80s saying that uh, they had a big group of patients who had varicocelia they had varicocelectomy and they achieved pregnancy. But subsequent studies showed that not everybody who has a varicocele needs a varicocelectomy. Uh, we will leave this to our colleagues, the andrologists, to discuss further. But sometimes the other uh, operations include vasostomy and epididymovasostomy. Vasovasostomy, for example, if we have congenital absence of the vas, or if we had a previous vasectomy. Now, we can reconstruct by doing an anastomosis, uh, provided that we have enough length in the vas deference to do the anastomosis, which can be done or better be done under a microscope, a surgical microscope. If we don't have enough length, uh, sometimes the surgeon will do uh, will attach the vas to the epididymis, so he'll do epididymal vasostomy, or sometimes even uh, orchidal uh, vasostomy. And of course, if all this doesn't work, we always can resort to assisted reproduction, which we are going to discuss in part, part four of this presentation. Uh, assisted reproduction consists of intrauterine insemination, uh, artificial insemination by donor, and also intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Now, intrauterine insemination, uh, as we uh, know, we uh, see uh, the lady at the beginning of her cycle will give her uh, some uh, stimulation, either in the form of chromophyll substrate, but better in the form of FSH, and we uh, monitor until she is about to ovulate, we uh, do the intrauterine insemination. We cannot take the sperm as it is and inject it inside of uh, the uterine cavity. The sperm consists of spermatozoa and seminal plasma seminal plasma which comes from the seminal vesicle and the prostate and these contain substances like prostaglandins which are going to produce uh, strong contractions in the uterus going to expel the sperm outside and pregnancy does not happen in this way so the, ha the sperm has to be prepared one method of preparation is the so-called swim up technique uh, the red is a cultured medium which contains the favorable uh, substances needed for the sperm and a proper pH, proper osmolarity. And we, what we do is that we layer our sperm, the sperm in blue color here, uh, and, uh, and put on top of it uh, our uh, culture medium. So the good spermatozoa 
are going to migrate from the blue to the red uh, and leaving any debris uh, below for example if there are also parcels for example or areas debris they're going to migrate to the upper portion which is the uh, the red uh, portion this is what's called the suimat technique sometimes people like to incline the tube to increase the surface area as you can see here and you put them in an incubator 5% incubator 37 degrees centigrade for an hour for one hour and then we take the red portion this is what the portion which is used for our insemination another technique is the so-called uh, percol uh, the, I mean or filtration technique if we had if you have a good number of uh, spermatozoa we can do our filtration technique and as you can see here uh, we put our yellow spermatozoa um, on top of the pink uh, if we are looking at the upper panel uh, the pink is the percol which is something like sand for example silica and then we put on top of it our sperm and we do centrifugation uh, by the end of centrifugation we find that the good sperms have penetrated to the depths we take these spermatozoa which has which have uh, at the bottom of the tube and we use them for insemination before doing this we may need to do a step of swim up as we can see on the right uh, lower panel again as we did before so and then we take this spermatozoa and we use them for intrauterine insemination and if all this fails we uh, can always go to micro manipulation what is micro manipulation now <clears throat> at the beginning people said well uh, if we want we can facilitate the function of the sperms how we can do this we do this by parcel zona dissection the american calls it pzd at the upper left side of our slide here uh, we uh, treat the zona without opening it just to make it thin to facilitate the function of the sperm to make fertilization easier well to cut a long story short it doesn't it didn't give good results so the second technique that was used was the SUSI the subzonal insemination people said okay we are going to penetrate the zona but not the oocyte itself and we are going to deposit one spermatozoa under the zona calling it subzonal insemination SUSI it did produce some pregnancies but it was not a very successful treatment until in 1992 ICSI came and ICSI intracytoplasmic sperm injector we are told that um, uh, Giampiero Palermo who was working in the um, in Belgium in the um, um, Brussels free, uni uh, the free University of Brussels uh, under the guidance of Professor uh, André van Schaertega uh, and uh, Professor de Vrooy and uh, uh, accidentally uh, he penetrated the oocyte and uh, the following day he discovered that fertilization has happened so a decision was taken to put back the oocyte because it had started to uh, divide and produce a beautiful embryo so they put it back and the patient became pregnant and this is how ICSI was born uh, to do this of course we need a micro manipulation uh, system and uh, it is an inverted microscope and you can see here inverted meaning that the um, objectives are under uh, the stage while illumination comes from above contrary to our student microscope we all know and this inverted microscope is also um, um, provided with uh, micro manipulation tools meaning what these are joysticks and the embryologist who is sitting here when he moves the joystick one centimeter this will translate under the microscope to one micron for example so he can do his micro manipulation from the left side he holds the old side and from the right side for example as you can see here from the left side he is holding the oocyte by very uh, mild suction and trying to keep the first polar body at the position 12 or position 6 for that matter meaning away from the injection site and from the right side he comes with a needle which is even thinner containing one spermatozoon and this is going to be injected inside 
the whole lemma inside the whole site and then this is going to be the intracytopermic sperm injection which is needed if um, we have male infertility um, and we can do this of course with uh, spermatozoa but even if the husband is azospermic uh, we can use uh, testicular sperm uh, on the left side we have a male who had azospermic but his azospermic was due to an obstruction what we call obstructive azospermia obstructive azospermia meaning that the sperm the testis is functioning properly it is producing good sperm but the problem is that there is an obstruction so if we do a needle aspiration we will obtain good sperm and this is called testicular sperm aspiration tesa with an a uh, on the other hand on the right side we have a man who is azospermic yes but his testis is not functioning properly so the quantity and the quality of the spermatozoa he is producing are bad therefore uh, we need in this case to do a biopsy really a testicular sperm extraction with an open biopsy we call this tesa with an e with an e because it gives us a good amount of uh, tissue where we can look for uh, uh, any spermatozoa which we uh, can use for our uh, ICSI sometimes of course we don't find like cases of Sertoli cell only syndrome so with this we come to the end of this presentation and as you can see uh, we were going to proceed after that to part two which uh, is about the ovarian factor in infertility then part three the other factors of infertility and finally part four uh, to discuss in more detail assisted reproduction with this, I come to the end of presentation and thank you very much for your attention.